Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to my Talent Pipe webinar. This is, I don't know, about the 40th that we've done in the last few years. I'm not really keeping count, to be honest, unlike other people who do these kinds of shows. But um, I, uh, I'm delighted today to introduce you to Lewis Malley. Um, Lewis is based in London, runs an executive search firm there. Just in case you don't know me, I'm Adam Gordon. I'm co-founder and CEO at Candidate ID. I spent 20 years in recruitment and recruitment marketing. Um, and Lewis and I are today going to be talking about marketing within recruitment um, with a bit of a focus on the exec search world because that's where Lewis is. And um, Lewis invited me onto his podcast um, about six weeks back. And we, we did a really, really fun podcast together um, to talk about talent pipeline automation. And it's really got yeah. me intrigued by podcasting and actually exec search firms in marketing and how they maybe should be communicating with clients and customers and generating um, generating kind of goodwill and share of voice and that sort of thing. So, um, Lewis, first off, uh, give us a quick introduction. What's your CV look like and, and tell us about what you do today? My CV looks awful. I need to spot it up a little bit. Um, but I, uh, I run Bentley Lewis, which is an exec search firm, and I've been in the executive search industry for coming up to 13, 14 years. Um, it's an interesting story. I started out doing chemistry at uni, realized I don't want to be sitting in front of a computer modeling liquid crystals for the rest of my life. So I went into the fashion sector, fashion and manufacturing, had my own business, and then went into exec search. And it's been awesome. And I set up my own business nine and a half years ago. So coming up to 10 soon, which would be really cool. And then um, we cover Europe. Uh, we just opened an office in the US, so we do international uh, executive searches. And I started a podcast um, about a year and a half ago. In fact, we have two podcasts. I have Don't Take Out Your Phone, which is my personal podcast, which is all about storytelling and speaking to people in business, science, and technology, uh, which is really cool and great fun. And then I have a podcast for my business, which is called The Recruitment Show, which I do with my colleague, Aldo. Uh, and that's kind of really short form, eight to 10 minutes, like how-tos and a little bit of advice and, and so forth. So all of that keeps me really busy. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's. So I'm going to stop on a few of those things. Um, your firm specializes in uh, financial services, but also the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, so we, we cover financial services, healthcare, and technology. Oh. The technology kind of cuts across, yeah, tech cuts across everything, right? And med tech, insure tech, fintech. In fact, arguably, all, all firms are tech firms. Even WeWork are trying to claim they're a tech firm, but that hasn't gone so well for them recently. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we cover those industries, and, and the reason being... I think to run an exec search firm, you you need to be a little bit broader. Um, you know, every industry sector is in a different economic cycle, and and it's important to to spread a little bit. And also, you don't end up having too many no poach agreements in each set, uh, which is a problem if you're an exec search firm. And then um, from geography wise, we we always covered Europe. And again, it's nice to be um, like a, a boutique, but also being able to cover international searches, which has worked well for us. Yeah, there's quite a few parallels, though, between those industries. So I, I understand about what you say. Technology is a constant through every industry today. But um, I guess there's a lot of regulatory issues in the other industries you cover, the life sciences and um, uh, and, and kind of banking profession, um, financial services as well. Yeah, yeah, so financial services, pharma, healthcare generally are very, very well regulated sectors. Um, and so um, there's little, there's sometimes a little crossover between financial services and healthcare or pharma. But certainly, you know, you need to know, uh, you know what's going on, what the developments are, you need to know about regulations. Um, and for us, frankly, I really like healthcare. Um, it's interesting. And I also like financial services. And when you're, when you're working, I think it's important to work in places and industries that you enjoy. And the types of people you end up speaking to, again, really, really interesting. Um, it makes it much more exciting. Do you think your background in chemistry has uh, been of any particular use or inspiration or, <clears throat> you know, within uh, uh, Probably not. 
I probably could have done any anything at all. I just I did chemistry because I was interested in science. Well, I thought I was good at it anyway. I wasn't really that good at it, but I got into university, and it gives you a really good methodical way of thinking. So, um, so I think the things I've learned from science is just being structured, organised, managing my time effectively. So, doing science at uni. Uh, I had like five or six hours a day of lectures and labs, which doesn't sound too much when you're working 10 hours a day. But when you're living with a history grad who's doing one hour a week or something like that or whatever they do, it's quite a me. lot. People are like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, so I was like, you, know, you go out and you, you get drunk and then you go to your uni and you can't miss out your lectures because you've got to follow up. So it, it got me quite organized early on. Um, and, and the scientific like structured way of thinking is really good, certainly for sales and for consulting and, and stuff like that. But the subject matter, I've probably completely forgotten now. Um, so I think that, yeah, the general skills you learn at uni and doing those things was very useful. Yeah, absolutely. So I, for, for me, I did, I did history and politics. And for me, the only thing it really did was teach me to write, write properly and structure an argument. That was pretty much it. But um it's a, it's a skill that I think is important in, in recruiting. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely, definitely. You took, I want, before we go on to the main subject, which is around marketing, I want to talk about um, you. It didn't take you long before you actually founded your own business. I think you were, what, four, f less than five years into it when you decided to set up on your own and be an entrepreneur. Uh, tell yeah. us what made you, what, how did you come to that decision? And tell us about that, that experience. So um, after chemistry, um, my parents, probably luckily for me, they didn't push me into a career. So often um, you get pushed into, you know, be an accountant, be a lawyer, uh, do something safe, contribute, you know, all of these types of things. But I was, um, I, didn't, I wasn't interested in that. I didn't want to work for a big company. I wanted to do my own thing. I used to work from about 12 years old with my cousin, who's a ladies wear designer. And he had me packing boxes, folding plastic bags, folding knitwear. Um, as I got older, selling clothes to women and, and all of these types of things. And I saw how he ran his business, how he built it. Um, so maybe, you know, that gave me a little bit of like entrepreneurial a desire to do something. And then both of my parents are from the UK. They, they immigrated here. Um, and so you also, you get a little bit of that. You want to like, you want to build something. You, you want to... You want to be, you know, I, I quite for me, I quite like um, being reliant on myself. I like to, you know, I put the effort in, I get something out of it. Um, I don't want to be an employee. I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I want to build something and and all the, everything that goes with it. Um, so after uni, I set up a fashion distribution company. And this might sound a bit weird, but we sold British clothes in Italy. And um, as we know, Italians are great for tailoring and, and all of that stuff, but they love British streetwear, jeans, T-shirts, stuff like that. So me and another cousin of mine, we sold jeans and T-shirts in Milan for about two years, which was awesome. I signed up some brands in the UK with our agent there, and it was great. I met a factory owner in Turkey uh, a couple of years in, and he asked me to run his sales office here, which I did. And we made for Ted Baker and Jasper Conrad and Arcadia and all of those things. And yeah. it was great fun. I was thinking about doing the distribution company properly. And a friend was in the recruitment sector, and he was talking to me about his job. And the sales process sounded really interesting. So I was selling T-shirts, and they can't refuse to be sold, and they don't have their own opinion yeah. and all of these things. In yeah. our industry, you have people on either sides with different wants, needs, desires, influences, you know, all of that stuff. So it's really quite a complex sales process. It requires a lot of listening, you know, much more listening than trying to sell a T-shirt and, you know, and it was really interesting. And I joined us for a firm. There were about six people and um, I stayed for four or five years. And you tend to want to start a business in something you think you're good at. And yeah. so I thought, well, I enjoyed it. I thought I was quite good. I'd done a decent stint and I'd wanted to do my own business. I happened to be in the recruitment sector and my mum in the end just said, either do it or don't talk to me about it again. So I was like, yeah. uh, okay. So um, I, uh, and I enjoyed it there, you know, so I, anyway, I went to see the guys. I said, look, I want to do my own business. Um, thanks for your salary. I don't want it. And I'm jumping off the cliff and 
once you've got, you know, once you're just off the cliff and you're, you're reliant on yourself, then really cool things happen. But I, um, I really thought about the lifestyle. I read a great book called uh, The Second Bounce of the Ball by a guy called Sir Ronald Cohen, who was the founder of Apex Partners, who were the first PE firm in Europe. And um, his book's awesome. And it gets you thinking about, is this the life for me? Um, and then you start a business and you think you're a business owner, but actually um, you're working harder and longer for less money than you were before. And you're the HR guy, the sales guy, marketing, cleaner, coffee. I mean, literally everything. And it's not until you um, identify jobs that you need done and start hiring people and, and start taking uh, a risk, then you can start to create a business. And it's a big learning curve, um, but it was the best thing I've ever done. And it gives me a lot of energy and it's great fun. How did you meet your co-founder? Um, I, well, it's me, myself and I. So I was talking to, <laughs> it's just me, it's just me. So I set up on my own. Um, the second hardest thing, apart from deciding to start a business, is deciding on a name. And so I had like 60 names, some cool Latin, Greek, um, all of that kind of stuff. And um, in the end, I thought, Lewis is a good surname. And what can I put in front of it that makes it sound like it's not just me on my own in a tiny little office in London? Um, and so I thought, Bentley, it's high up in the alphabet. It's a long established British brand. And um, it went like that. So, yes. Okay. So, um, tell me about your team, though, because again, this is like, for me, this is part of marketing. In fact, for me, almost every aspect of a recruitment business is marketing. So, um, you've got a team of eight, eight, ten people, something like that. And I don't think anybody is second generation British. They're all, you introduced me to a lot of your team. Is that, is that, why, is that no. because it's London or is that, what's the, uh, tell me. No, no, you can't be contrived about this stuff. The thing, the, so the diversity conversation uh, globally um, is just hot at the moment. And a lot of big companies, um, they try and, and have a diverse firm by design, which is, is not cool, right? It never really works. They're trying to have a quality of outcome. They want a certain percentage to be female, BAME, whatever. And for us, we're a small firm and, um, and we believe in a quality of opportunity. And, um, and we just meet people and if we like them, we hire them. And as it happens, we have, um, so my mum's from South Africa. She was my first employee, by the way, after she told me to, <laughs> to crack on. Um, so South Africa, we have, I was first generation here. Another colleague of mine, she's first generation here. The, the others, Ecuador, Bulgaria, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, America. I mean, all over. But London, where we're based here, most people that live here aren't from the UK. I think 55% of people are. So it's the most diverse city in the world. Certainly the one, I don't think there's anywhere else more diverse. And it just by virtue of being in, the, in, in London, like we have an awesome, awesome diverse team. And it makes it interesting, lots of different opinions, lots of discussion, better quality decisions. But we don't, we know, we, we don't go, and we've got someone from uh, Nigeria. It's just, it's just, you know, it's being in London. Um, I'd, be really interested, I'd be really interested to know if you had diversity of opinion around Brexit, but I, uh, I very much doubt you do. That's probably the one, one area that you're all um, agreed on, I would guess. Well, most, most people, I think, from London wanted to remain in Europe. Um, so, I, to be honest, everyone in my office wanted to stay in Europe. What you have diversity on is, do you want another vote? <clears throat> is it yeah. time to get out now? Um, you, you know, and we, I think one, one thing we've all agreed on is um, we all view it as some tragic comedy on Netflix that we tune in for one episode, we tune out next episode, <laughs> So um, the, the big thing, though, for us and our motto for the year, we kind of have a motto every year. It's not to worry about the things we can't affect. And worrying yeah. about something like Brexit, it just affects your day, your week, your month, your year. Yeah. And you, in our industry, people are, are quite into targets and KPIs and stuff, right? If you come into the office at 8 a.m. 
and you're depressed because something you've read about Brexit, I mean, it's just going to affect your whole day. So we don't even, we don't let it affect us. We just crack on and do the best we can. So. Yeah. I, I've said the same thing for 30 years. Don't worry about things you can't control. Yeah. So yeah. let's go on to marketing. So why is, why do you think, mark, why is marketing important for an organization like yours? Let's talk about it from the perspective of a search firm, really. And then we can maybe contextualize it a bit broader than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, if we just broaden it out, I mean, for, for any business, um, marketing is the most important thing. Um, and if you look maybe at the history of our industry, so exec search or contingent recruitment or whatever, the classic marketing is um, coffee, lunch, dinner. So the face to face, um, a round table breakfast. That's really innovative. Um, writing articles. Um, then, um, then, the, then the classic kind of like cold calling, marketing a candidate, um, or body breaking or whatever you want to call it. So, so they're like the kind of classic things. Now, everything evolves, everything moves on, everything changes, and and you need to evolve. And you just have to look at, you know, Blockbuster, HMV, all of these big corporate failures in recent history that have just failed to innovate. And if you, you know, the classic thing, if you always do what you've always done, you You'll always get what you always get you know those kind of things and nowadays um you have linkedin and, and loads of email linkedin all of these kind of th these tools people are using to sell to people um and nowadays in the uk um the us certainly just there's so many people trying to sell to you and in our industry in fact every industry no one likes to be sold to and so these things aren't yeah, as effective yeah. as they want but i mean you know, I got a sales call like just before. He was like, I've got 30, oh, I wanna, I wanna sell you this thing in 30 seconds. So I looked at my phone at 30 seconds had already gone and he hadn't even started yet. But he didn't ask me any questions, didn't wanna listen to me, did, wasn't interested in me. You know, so a lot, a lot of businesses and a lot of businesses in our industry, they're trying to sell something. They're trying to sell their recruitment services. They're trying to sell their sector expertise. They're trying to sell something. Um, and I think it's evolved now really where it's about. So, yeah, the face-to-face -face stuff is the most important for me. Um, you know, there's nothing better than face-to-face. -face. But how you get there, you can do in different ways. And for me yeah. now, it's all about um, content generation. So um, generating relevant content for our particular industry and our particular um, uh, population of people, our network, thinking about what's relevant for them, what they want to hear about, and sharing our sharing our knowledge, um, being experts in our field, and generating regular, interesting, consistent content. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I a couple of things I wanted to wanted to um, just add to that. So, your <clears throat> that phrase about if you always do what you've always done. So I would, I would today, I would finish that off with, you will not get what you used to get. If you always do what you've always done, you will no longer get what you used to get. And the reason for that is because the world's, you know, the world's, the world's changing. You don't get what you used to get. So um, I think that's something that's quite important. The other thing is nobody likes to be sold to. And in you, you said it, in recruitment, <clears throat> even if you're in exec search, you are still you are selling something in two different directions, both and both sides of your supply chain. You are selling something. So, um, you're, even if it's just the time, you're selling you're selling that you that the person needs to give you time. You're selling the so we are all deluged with information and things that we need to do, and we're more time poor than we ever have been. And so, I think the job in recruitment is therefore harder and harder. And because of that, you're right. The, what you really want is FaceTime with the companies that you can hire for and with the candidates that you can put into jobs. And if, you, if your recruiters are spending all their day doing that, then great, you've got, a, you've got a brilliant business. But unfortunately, in our world, we're spending more time than we should be um, talking to people who are not ready for a conversation with us. So this is where the whole thing about content comes in, I believe. Yeah, well, so so the FaceTime for sure. Um, but think about this though. So how many people can you see in a day? Um, so, so let's say you're out seeing, let's say you decide to see three people a day, 
right? So that's awesome. How do you get the message out to a wider audience? Um, and so all of the stuff that comes with marketing, so um, sharing your knowledge, um, sharing your values, you're communicating all of those messages that you want communicated. Like, what's it like to work in my firm? What do we believe? Um, why do we do what we do? All of these things. So you can create really interesting, relevant content that you can distribute on all of your different channels. Um, and all of that, it come, it, when you go and meet people, it really, it really adds weight to the conversations. Also, it means that more people are seeing you more often. So let's say I might yeah. meet you once a quarter. That's great. You hear from me once a quarter. Um, but now, meet once a quarter, you see that I've shared some in insights about uh, talent pipelining or how to design a great recruitment press, whatever it might be. And you're seeing me regularly. It's interesting content. You see me on all the different platforms. And suddenly, and you're listening to me on my podcasting. Um, you see me on video. I mean, you know, you're seeing me everywhere and you see me in real life and it just adds an awful lot of weight and not enough firms in our industry are doing that and it's super important now to do okay so um i wonder is this do you think this is more important in some industries than others no i think the most i think the big thing the big objective for marketing for me is driving brand awareness so letting your clients your candidates um, the population of people, your 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 network know uh, what you're all about, and then the other big thing is uh, credibility. So I want to be seen as an expert in my field. I want to communicate that to people that might want to work with me. So trust um, what we do. It needs to be relevant. Um, but I never sell anything on this content. So it's free content. I'm giving. I'm giving stuff for free. I'm not asking you to use me in return. So none of none of the communications and the and the the, the writing or the audio or not, not, none of it's really sales. It's all really giving stuff. And if you give, then you ultimately end up receiving. And people like consuming interesting, relevant content. And so now, almost, I view the firm as we develop interesting educational content by the way we do executive search um and that's that's my mindset now with all of this stuff so i'm i'm, I'm glad you said that around you know you, you're not you're not asking for anything in return at that point but i think what you do is you generate goodwill you generate yeah. goodwill yeah. from all of the people you've said the phrase people who might want to work with you you've said that a few times and i think to me i think that could be candidates it could be employers or it could be actually people who might be interested in working with Bentley Lewis. So I think it could be all, all of those people. Um, and I, I noticed that you, you've been quite broad in the way that you've defined that. And I think that what you generate is people who may want to work with you because you've got goodwill from, uh, from those who um, are consuming that content. Yeah, definitely. Because if, you know, if you know your audience, so our audience absolutely could be um, amazing uh, recruiters, search consultants that want to come and work with us. It could be clients that need us to represent them and hire for them. It could be candidates that are thinking about moving, you know. So there's so if you know your audience, then you can start to think about your approach and then start communicating that to the, the relevant audiences. So so marketing, it's important to it's important to note that you need to really start right from the beginning. What are your values? What are you trying to achieve? Who are you talking to? Know your audience. What are they going to want to hear about? And then you can start developing content. Then you can start sharing it. You can see all the analytics. You can see what's working and modify. So it's it's really, really important. And to keep on also um, to go, go back to why you're doing it. So I've got a great marketing manager called Amira. And we sit down every month and we go through all of this stuff. And um, it's really important to plan and do it properly. So. So do you think that, is, does it prioritize, does your content kind of approach prioritize clients or potential candidates or any particular group, or is it encompassing all of those? Um, well, it's encompassing all of them. I mean, basically what you need to do, I mean, classic marketing is design, I mean, who are your personas, you know, like in classic marketing, you do kind of four personas. And so you might think about what your audience looks like. Um, 
what do they like to do in their spare time? What do they like to read about or listen to or watch? Are they congregating on YouTube? Are they congregating at, um, on uh, Spotify? What are their main pain points? What do they go on to hear about? Um, so it's, and, and so if you think about all these things, then you're going to be generating relevant content, not just sharing a super cool quote you saw, you know, the other day, or, you know, that might be part of your strategy. Um, but you've really got to spend time thinking about it. Um, and the, the interesting thing, and you speak to a lot of recruiters or, or search consultants, and they don't really want to invest the time often in this stuff. It's like it's marketing, you know, you can't really see a direct impact. It's not like, um, you know, you can measure how many calls you've done, how many visits you've gone on, how many jobs have you got, you know, these kind of classic KPIs in the recruitment industry. This is uh, a lot of a lot of exec search consultants, recruiters, they're not really comfortable in this world of like stuff you can't always measure. Mm, yep. Um, but it, it, it does really have a big impact. And if you're doing it regularly, um, and consistently it's it really adds a lot of value so you've talked about analytics and you've talked about stuff you can't measure and interestingly i i do think that one of the reasons why marketing has become more popular within our industry as a discipline is because you can measure so much more than you could even just five years ago um so i think i think that uh for business owners um, and for CEOs and especially CFOs, they're probably looking at marketing and going, right, I can see exactly how that impacted the pipeline and uh, all of the good work we did four months ago, I can see that it's now paying off today. So you can do like, you know, I mean, if it's LinkedIn, you can see how many people have viewed it, how many have liked, commented, SEO rankings go up, so, you know, use your search terms and see how far you, how high you come up. Podcasting, I mean, we've gone from... We've gone from zero, and my friend's laughing at me, to about 10,000 a month now downloading our podcasts, um, which is really cool. You can do, you know, you can measure everything, candidate experience surveys. Um, you can then use that to improve your approach, how you do things, what's working, what's not. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff you can do as you really get into it. Um, yeah. It definitely just, you need to really plan it properly and, um, and take it seriously and not just oh we've stuck a thing on, on linkedin that's really cool or we've tweeted about something that's great because you know when you start you're getting no one engaging right i mean you might get a few likes you might get i mean takes a long time like really does yeah you need to think for for years to really like get a serious serious engagement yeah but it does work and people do see and you know it just builds snowballs so, so okay um I was just about to ask about channels and con um, content formats and things like that. Let's go to Lee's question. What channels and platforms do you send your content through? Um, so again, you have to think about what's relevant to your industry. So this might be different for different industries. Um, so for us, um, for business, LinkedIn is great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that in t for what we do, financial services, um healthcare all of those kind of things for us um it's great other industries you have to think about the way that you interact with your customers your candidates and stuff like that so each company is a bit different everyone has their own mission and values um and so you need to meet, communicate to your own audience so but the classic ones for us is linkedin uh, it's instagram it's twitter it's facebook those things and we communicate different things on different platforms but again, I think it really comes back to who, well, in this industry, who you're hiring. I mean, if you're hiring construction workers, it's going to be a bit different. Um, engineers, financial services and stuff like that. So think about where your people co congregate and that will then influence where you communicate your message. Yeah, for you, because your clients could be your candidates, I guess it's probably a little bit easier than if you're recruiting in, say, construction and your clients are kind of maybe, I don't know, HR people or something, and your candidates are working on construction sites. That would be a very different type of, again, it's about personas, but knowing your channels. For you, your channels are maybe a little bit easier. So ours for our channel, yeah, our channels are LinkedIn, um, Instagram, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, and we use different things for different things. So our Instagram, we're at Bentley Lewis People, 
and that is about us so it's yep. about um like what we do it's about our culture our values we're having fun and we're learning you know so for people that might want to work with us then it's a great thing and a lot of people uh, a lot of people check us out on instagram and it builds our credibility um it communicates trust and like what we're about and stuff like that uh yeah. linkedin is more um so business we're sharing our uh, knowledge content ideas how to's all of these kind of things um yeah. someone just this guy uh, mark asked about our podcast promotion which... lewis i'm deliberately i'm deliberately not answering not getting to mark's questions yet i've, I've seen mark's questions and i want to get to Mark's questions but there are a couple there's a couple of things we need to do to build up to that so uh, mark we will cover them um I want to talk about the obviously you've got your podcasts, but well before your podcasts, yeah. Did you did you do anything else? Did you do blogs? Did you write, do vlogs? Did you do webinars? Did you do did you do any other kind of content formats before you came to your podcasts? Um, so, if I before my podcasts, my main marketing activities were face to face. Um, which is cool. We've spoken about. I did quite a lot of writing. Can do ten thousand downloads face to face though. Can't, well, exactly. Can't do ten thousand downloads face to face. So, I was just doing loads of lunches. I mean, I put on weight. I was like eating loads of food. Started the gym. Anyway, but I was doing a lot of that stuff. I was doing a lot of writing. So I've done um, a bunch of articles for the FT and various other um, papers and stuff like that. I wrote stuff for link uh, on LinkedIn, so you know you can publish your own articles on LinkedIn. So I was yeah. writing stuff there, um, a bunch of other places as well. And it's cool, but we all know it takes like, like what, five, six hours maybe to write a really good piece of written content, like a quality article, five, 600 words, whatever. Um, so I was doing that. We were doing round table breakfast. We were doing all the classic, stuff that you do marketing a business like ours um and it was cool um but then i started thinking about doing things differently because i like to do things differently like we're a unique business um and i want to do things my way like the really yeah. cool thing about setting up your own business is being able to do it your own way so then um so then you can start thinking about again what your audience wants to hear about and, and all of those things and then we started to develop different marketing initiatives and that's when we really started to to change things up when did you hire your first marketing professional um one year ago yeah one year okay. ago very new so it was sorry go did you get to, okay okay we'll come we'll come on to that because i think the podcast predates is it um yeah amira so amira, tell, us, yeah. tell us about we'll come on to amira in a minute but tell us about the how did you get to podcasts Okay, so, um, so I was sitting. I sat down. It was like so about a, let's say a couple of years ago. Um, this is going really well. I'm building a good business, but how can I, how can I really like up it? And and there's always the classic stuff, right? You hire uh, more consultants that generate more revenue. That's cool. Some work, some don't. You continue doing the old stuff you've always done. Um, but I think I, and I was just thinking to myself, a lot of the stuff I've done to get to my position here might not necessarily work going forward. And I don't want to be another corporate failure. And I've seen a lot of search businesses go under, uh, even in the last six months, you know, a lot of, a lot of struggling going under all of these types of things. So I wanted to just, I wanted to continue to evolve. So I thought, what can I do? So that was my, I was putting that, that thought around my head. Then the second, the, the, the next bounce of the bull book, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the uh, webinar, um that's classic right that's all we're thinking about what's next so okay great i'm doing well now doesn't mean i'm going to do well tomorrow um so i've been always always thinking a little bit about how i can stay relevant and then i live about 20 minutes from where i work so all my mates were talking about what books they've read and i was like mm, i haven't read anything this year like i haven't got time when do i read it like i i, I live on the uh, on the northern line which if you don't know um you basically are in each other's armpits community you can't hold a book i started reading on my phone but it got knocked down my hand i mean it's just a nightmare so then i put my headphones where you, in where, where do you live you live in bell park or somewhere do you i'm trying to go uh, north in, 
Holloway, yeah, Islington, in Islington, Borough of Islington. Yeah, I okay. work in a bank, which is by the Bank of England in the city of London. So it's Northern Line. I go to Archway, whatever. It's like 20 minutes. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it means I, I don't get a chance to read. So I started listening to audio books and I started listening to podcasts and it transforms my learning. And for the first time in history now with, with podcasts and YouTube and stuff is you can learn by listening. You haven't got to read anymore, um, which globally is amazing because you can be illiterate, but still learn yeah. cool stuff. And uh, yeah. I get a lot of, I retain a lot of information from listening and I can regurgitate some random stuff that I've learned on a podcast. And so all of this stuff ha was happening at the same time. And I thought, Hey, why don't I just press record? Um, and so I, I messaged a few mates and they all laughed at me. It's like, okay. Um, and then one guy, a friend called Matt Jaffa, um, he was like, yeah, I'll come podcast with you. And he, he runs um, the Federation of Small Businesses in uh, the UK. So that we're SMEs and stuff. And so we sat down and I had a little lapel mic. The name, and we plugged actually, in. I've heard, yeah, I've heard, I've heard the name. That's where I got it. Right. Okay. I wondered how I knew that name, Matt Jaffa. Yeah. So he was like, we lived together at uni. We were mates. He was like, I was like, come in. He was like, okay, cool. And we had these lapel mics. It attached to my phone. So it cost like um, zero pounds. And yeah. we started chatting um and then uh you have to distribute it so um which is really interesting because i'm you know like a lot of people you get labeled something right i'm a headhunter i'm a recruiter but actually you can be multiple things i'm also yeah. a husband a dad a crossfitter a recruiter um a podcaster once you get in the mindset of you can do a few things then I started thinking, mm, I can start building this digital business, which is a podcast um, mm -hmm. and it's free audio content. And I started distributing it on iTunes and Spotify. Um, and then I thought, right, I need some help. And so Amira answered our call and she joined us. And then we really started to ramp it up. So Lee's asked, Lee's, Lee's also asked, did you use any outside agencies or anything like that? Or did you just do it yourself? And, and, and literally hire into the team straight away? Hired into the team straight away. Um, I went through a thought process, to be fair. Yep. So I thought, do I hire uh, um, a, a permanent marketeer for the team? And I had never hired a marketing person for an executive recruitment firm before. Um, it's always been um, business development or 360 degree or researchers, yep. et cetera, which is kind of quite classic. Um, I, I went to speak to some agencies, uh, PR firms. I, I tried to understand what they offer, what they do, what the cost is. Um, and after all of these conversations, I, uh, I arrived for me. Uh, what would work for me best is to hire someone. And she works full time, member of staff. And um, for us, it's been great. OK, now let's go on to some specifics about podcasting. Mark's got some questions. Let's go. Let's go through. I, I know Mark, and uh, so he's, I know he's going to answer ask some good, ask some good questions. How do you promote your podcasts? Hey, There's Mark. lots of different aspects to this. How do you promote them? Okay, so um, you can find them everywhere you can find a podcast. So Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, Podcast Addict, Google Podcasts. It's distributed everywhere. Um, the really cool thing with podcasts is it doesn't cost you anything to distribute them. So you just need to ask Google how to do it and it will tell you. So it goes everywhere. I started a YouTube channel. Again, they don't charge you to start a YouTube channel. And you just need to start uploading videos and audio and whatever you want to do. Yeah. So it's everywhere you can find a podcast. YouTube's a great platform. So is iTunes. So is Spotify. It's worth being everywhere. Um, and but that's then, not um, promotion. But that's not. I would argue that's not about promotion. Distribution. That's distribution. So uh, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of yeah. both because people search within iTunes for podcasts that they want to listen to. So yeah. so that's why they ask you to put your keywords, your tags, your class of podcasts and stuff. And we get found. To be fair, we get found in uh, in iTunes. We were number one on business iTunes category in the UK. Um, yeah yeah which is cool um and then again thinking going back to my original marketing is where where am i where am my network congregating 
And so when you start a podcast, you have zero listens and downloads. Um, who's going to listen first? So I tell my friends, I tell my family, I tell my business contacts. You can, um, you can tweet, you can Instagram, you can Facebook, you can do a Facebook story, Insta story, do everything. I mean, wherever you have a population or congregation of people, tell them what you're up to. And that's what I did. And it starts. So you're, cross, to you're, you're cross referencing from your social media to the podcasts, and yeah. you are like pollinating. It's pollinating. Cross pollinating. Yeah, I think they call it backlinks. You're you're referencing yourself all over the place. Um, so if you follow yeah. me on Instagram, um, you can see my stories, and I'm like, hey, I'm live with Adam on the podcast. Um, you know those kind of things. In fact, I think we're just about. Well, about to post the story. Yeah, I think we're actually about to, hold on, here we go. About to press post on my story by live with you. And this is behind the scenes on my live webinar. So that's the kind of stuff that we do. Um, cool. and again you've got to do it. Yeah, it's really cool. Um and we've got to you've got to do it regularly, consistently, you've got to let people know what you're up to, otherwise how are they gonna know? Um and also, you know, don't it could feel daunting, right? I mean, from zero you want people to listen, but if you don't start, yeah. you can't do anything. And the biggest, okay. biggest problem is people are too too scared to start. Like just, just go test, try things out. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, agreed. Yeah. You know, the worst that can happen is nobody listens, and then if they don't listen, then it doesn't matter. You haven't lost anything. So, Absolutely. what are the channels Absolutely. that? What are the channels that work best on, in terms of your podcast distribution channels? Yeah, Where so uh, um, it's really well. So, this is the interesting thing about podcasting is um, it's really hard to measure uh, exactly which platforms they're on. So, Spotify, for example, won't give you the list of how many people listened on Spotify uh, or how many. I think iTunes have just introduced one. So, we host ours on SoundCloud. So, we get total listens, we get which countries they're from um the time of day that they listen and all of that stuff um uh, at the moment uh youtube is our biggest platform for people yep. for listening to our podcast yeah um so i guess the challenge with that is a lot of people are not downloading yet on youtube are they so they can't really listen to it on the tube and they can't really listen to it like uh any if they don't have wi-fi so so it's a mix i guess some people some people listen on their commute to and from work and that's yeah. that form is more around um the spotify the itunes and stuff like that a lot of people um listen in their lunch break so we do uh you can you can read the um the subtitles so a lot of people read yeah. subtitles um if they don't want to speak to their husband or wife in bed they can watch it on their phone in bed and so it, the cool thing about these things is people can listen anywhere they want. I don't care if they listen while they're getting dressed in the morning, whether they're lying in bed on YouTube or whether they're listening to me on their commute to work on iTunes. They're able to choose how they want to do it. I'm not telling them they have to listen to me like this. I'm giving them the choice to decide yeah. how yeah. they want to consume the content. Um, and I think that's important. It's a, it's a, for me, it's a really key rule of uh, marketing communications is – if you give people things in the in multiple different formats, in the channels they prefer, in the formats they prefer, more people are going to interact with you. It's as simple as that. So um, when when do you do you post your podcasts at a very specific time? Are you consistent with that? Does that matter? Does it not matter? So we so don't take out your phone. We post on a Sunday at six p.m. GMT. Um, so that's what we do. It's on YouTube. It's on everywhere from 6 p.m. The Recruitment Show, which is our other podcast, um, we do at different times. Again, it's about experimenting. I'm not sure it really matters because um, if people are signing up and registering, like if, so if you subscribe to my podcast right now on iTunes, you're going to get an alert that there's a new podcast, whether you it pops up at 2 a.m. or 2, it doesn't really matter. And the really cool thing is obviously once the podcasts are out, they're out there forever. So you can listen to my first podcast with Matt Jaffa and listen at how bad it was uh, compared to my recent podcasts where the sound quality is better and, and you just, 
you know you improve and stuff like that so it's always out there you can reshare you can keep promoting it um and i still get listens from the first podcast because when people find you on an itunes or spotify they like they flick through all of your podcasts and they're like oh that's that's really interesting um you know listen to that one um so that's also really cool how many podcasts do you of other people's do you subscribe to if any that's a great um, so my main one i listen to is the joe rogan experience um yeah. So Joe Rogan, um, he's a comedian and UFC commentator, and he's got one of the most popular podcasts. Um, I'll actually show you, if you want, my, uh, my podcast list. So I use Google Podcasts and, and Podcast Addict. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, if you can see there. But for, for my sins, yeah. for my sins I, support, uh, I support Watford Football Club. Uh, yeah. So I listen to the Watford podcast. Um, the Joe Reagan experience, uh, the TED hour is really good. Um, startup, the knowledge project, the Tim Ferriss show is really good. The school of greatness is great. So there's some cool stuff. The one I really listen to most is Joe Reagan because, and his is long format, two and a half hours. Um, and with two and a half hours, you can really get in depth of, on a, on a topic and it takes me about a week to listen to on and off. Um, but I learned some quite cool stuff. So, so uh, Lee's asked, what does Joe Rogan have to do with executive search? Um, why do I need to listen to stuff about executive search? <laughs> great question. Yeah. Great, res great response. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think it's about being a well-balanced human. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I'm speaking to, um, this is in all seriousness, right? I, I speak to everyone from a CEO of an insurance company to uh, a partner from a private equity firm to a scientist who's just developed a really cool new piece of medical technology, a heart yeah. surgeon, a CFO. I mean, you know, executive search, you need to be a generalist, right? You're never going to know really in depth. I'm not going to know how to do a heart surgery or how to develop a new drug, but on a high level, I can have a conversation with anyone about anything. Yeah. Um, and for us in our industry, you need to have really good general knowledge. You need to be able to ask the right questions. You need to be able to have a meaningful conversation. And so um, your, your education and your listening shouldn't just be focused on um, your industry. It should be focused yeah. on related industries, industries you recruit into, um, what's going on in the economy, politics. Yeah. You know. I, I get why. I mean, the the podcast that you're subscribing to, I can I can understand why I might get value from all of those. I'm I'm really specific, so I only I, I subscribe to Saster, which is about building SaaS businesses, um, and two or three which are about recruitment technology. Really quite specific recruitment te recruitment technology and 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 software as a service. Um, yeah, yeah. Lee's, Lee's made another co comment which I want to just just uh, yeah. respond to. So Lee said. Question, how do you get a recruiter from working? Answer, put a phone in front of him. But Lee, right. for years, so, Lee. You've been, for Lee, for Lee, for years, you've been telling me that the only tool a recruiter needs is a phone. And now you're saying the phone's distracting him from work. So. Is that what he's, that what he's saying? Is a phone, put a phone, how do you get a recruiter from, how do you get a recruiter from working? Put a phone in front of them. So this thing here, runs our business right it's also the most distracting thing in the world um and so the problem with in fact we were talking about in the office just now um about how you stay uh being distracted is a big problem right generally um and so in our industry you need to get into your zone right let's say you're doing business development you need to get into it, it takes 20 minutes to get into your zone you need to focus you need to make your phone calls or however you want to do business development or well, if you're sourcing, again, you really need to get into it. And this phone, it distracts people. Um, it pings, you go on social media, you get a private phone call. So you need to manage yourself properly. Um, I mean, um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. The, the key to being a successful human in 2019, as far as I'm concerned, is being having brilliant filters. If you don't, you're you're going to find life really really tough you're going to burn you're going to burn out in weeks oh yeah and also the other thing just to kind of like tie up the um why am i not listening to executive search stuff to be to be successful uh, today and tomorrow it's have this growth mindset 
Um, I speak a lot about it on the podcast. I write a lot about it, but it's not just, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And in in any industry, you need to continue to evolve and develop and learn new things, whether it's trying this in your recruitment business, whether it's, um, you know, learning about some new technology that's coming into the insurance industry or whatever it is, um, you really need to learn about it. And then the soft skills, of course, are important as well. You need to continue to, to develop those. So what topics do you, we've got a couple of other questions from Sylvia, but uh, I'll come on to in a minute. But what, what, what do you cover in the recruitment podcast? What's the sort of scope of the topics? Okay, so um, if you, um, well, while I'm talking, um, if you go to YouTube, um, in fact, I'll post a link to it on YouTube uh, so you can see. Um, so the, the format of the podcast is um, how to's. And so it's short format. I'm just going to post a link here so you can see. So that's our YouTube channel. And so you can so the topics that we've been doing. So we released one yesterday, enhancing your digital footprint. Um, how long should you stay in the same job? Building your talent pipeline, preparing for leadership. Um, so these are how tos to um, hiring managers. So people hiring. Or it could be for um, aspiring leaders who want to take their or trying to get their first leadership role. Um, we, we talk about mindset a lot. So changing your mindset, climbing the mountain, crafting the right story, all of these things. And we're really led by our our community ask us to um, discuss certain things. And then yeah. we create podcasts and, and stuff. And then we started to invite people in to the podcast as well, so such as yourself. Um, who are expert in in your field, and then we do a uh, three way podcast. Um, and so that's so, how we um, Sylvia was asking, sort of, what's the ideal kind of length? I mean, the one that you and I did was about 10, 10 minutes. I think we were probably talking for about we probably talked for about twenty minutes, turned into ten minutes of content. Is that right, roughly? Yeah, like that? yeah, yeah. So, um, so Sylvia, so yeah, so schedule of content. So, um, so me and Amira. Uh, we sit down every month and we plan our content for the next month yeah. and we decide what we're going to do. Um, and so for the podcast, we do the same. Um, ideal length, uh, I don't think there is one. You could do a three-hour podcast. You could do a five-minute podcast. Everyone does yeah. it differently. Joe yeah. Rogan does two and a half to three hours. He's the most popular. Um, but it could equally That's be That's some length of time. I mean, who's got three hours of time to listen, I mean, presumably people listen to it in chunks in the way that they, they they must listen to half an hour here, half an hour there. It's quite interesting. You touched on it before we went live, right? We were talking about America being a big market for podcasts because yeah. people commute an awful long time. If your drive is an hour and a half, you've got Joe Rogan with you, your whole commute for the day, you're done. Um, whereas for me, 20 minutes, so it's going to take me like four or five days if I don't listen to it. So the other thing with the, the great thing with long format podcasts, which I'm a big fan of is that you can really get in depth on the topic. If I want to learn about, um, I don't know, quantum computing, um, you can't learn in five minutes about quantum computing. Uh, I want to hear it from a, from a, from a physicist about quantum computing and I'm happy to invest three hours of my time. Still, I've got no idea what they've just said, but um, you know, it's starting to seep in. Or I want to hear from uh, Edward Snowden about why he leaked all of the stuff. Three hours, two and a half hours. So you can learn some cool stuff. My my format for the recruitment show, we decided we wanted to do how-tos, pieces of advice, uh, short snippets, uh, little nuggets of advice, and it's gone down well. Um, and it's worked well for us. So, Yeah. Um, so yeah. I've just got, just responded to Lee. I don't, I, I'm not sure what Lee's questions really here. Lewis, um, all your videos are about exec search and career issues. Do you think Joe Joe Rogan is listening to you as well? So I've, um, I've said I've said I watch Tom Cruise films, but I doubt he watches mine. So I'm not really sure. What, I mean, Lewis watches Watford play football. I don't Watford watches Lewis play football. Um, unfortunately, I'm not quite as popular as Joe Rogan on the podcast scene yet. 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 So yeah. who knows? Maybe. At the moment, if Joe Rogan's listening, then amazing. If he's not, he will be soon. So. Uh, great question from Una. Do you use marketing automation or email software? 
Um, so we we do one um, a monthly journal where we we kind of sum up all of the content we've done that month, and we use um, uh, Monkey Mailchimp. Mailchimp. That's it, Mailchimp. Mailchimp. Yeah, good. That's it. Um, although Una, if if anybody's interested in doing anything further about marketing automation or email software, Una McGuinness is somebody to pick up with for sure. Um, yeah, so sorry, you know, if you do a lot of more, I mean, we tend to, uh, pleasure. Um, we tend to do again, uh, so to kind of rolling back, we don't do many sales. So we don't do any sales emails or mass emailing or anything really of that nature, apart from a monthly journal. Um, I mean, I think, I think for, I think from your perspective, you know, you're looking for, if you're using any kind of marketing automation type products. What you're really trying to do is get from you've got an audience of 10,000 down to the who are the five people I should pick up the phone to today that I don't know based on information I've got that suggests I should contact them. Um, because somebody's listened to your podcast isn't necessarily a big sort of high value buying signal. Um, but it's an interesting, an interesting, uh, interesting question, and nonetheless. You yeah, know, I think, um, I mean, it's in my industry. You know, we don't do it, but in different sectors, things, different things work differently. So again, you know, back to the point of think about who your audience is and what's going to work for them. And it might well be that uh, automated marketing works really, really well. Um, so the cool thing nowadays, you've got so many different tools that you can use to make your marketing and your sales and development really effective. Okay, so um, we're, we're kind of running out of time here. So um, I want to just ask one final question, which is um, what do you think is the future for marketing for an organization like yours? What do you think is going to change or develop or be enhanced? It could be an answer to do with channels or content formats or something or robots or anything. Robots, yeah. I think one robot replaces two humans. So... Um, so maybe they can automate the sourcing process. Who knows? Um, I think um, I think for us, um, it's all about this content generation P platform, and then we're going to be doing that more and more. Um, Platform-wise, uh, they say TikTok is going to be the next huge thing. So if you want to make an investment in in younger people, um, then invest some time building your TikTok presence. Um, so that's that. brilliant. Um, I've been trying to do it, but the people are telling me people are telling me not to. Um, but look, yeah. think about it, right? So um, I want to be here for a long time, and yeah. um, part of the part of the reason I do this um, um, sharing this content and, and all of this educational stuff is I want to help people um, do better in their careers and lives and stuff. So if if a fifteen year old or thirteen year old reads yeah. something from me about how they go about writing the right CV or how to approach a job interview and they get a great job, they're going to remember me in the future. And so in 10 years, 15 years, when they might be hiring, they might remember the small piece of advice I gave them and, uh, and they might call me. So TikTok is about a bit of investment into the future. But again, you know, it might or might not be right for you. No, listen, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, you, you think that's a bit of a long game, but quite frankly, I met a guy, Chris Long, from Transport for New South Wales last week in Paris, who told me that they are creating games, like immersive games, um, to do with um, kind of the built environment for five-year-olds, right? There's a recruitment. I mean, it's, it's about future recruitment. It's about getting people because they've got so many people in banking, professional services, things like that in Australia. They want people to be looking at Transport for New South Wales and going, I want a career there. So, you know, I, I think 13-year-olds on TikTok, that's not too early. No, 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 you've got to get on it. You've got to get on it. In fact, my uh, there's a great company called Code Monkey, which I podcasted with yeah. the founder, and they teach kids how to code. Um, yeah. My five-year-old, we play it every – I mean, you just – yeah, it's worth, you know, they call it selling – you can send the elevator back down, you know, all these – a lot of people talk about helping younger people and stuff like that, so – yeah, I mean, it's worth making it's worth making the investment in it. Whether TikTok's the platform, a lot of people think it will be the main platform. Um, but it may knows? be. It, it may it may be the only thing is it is owned by a Chinese business, so it may well get the the Huawei treatment at some point from 
America and the UK, but we'll have to wait and see. By that time, China's taken over. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Lewis, thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you again and look forward to catching up again soon sometime. Absolutely. Great. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Good to speak. Bye for now. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.